Okay, so today we're going to go over some basic ICU skills. If you've never spent time in a hospital, these are good things to practice and learn about before you jump into patient care. So first we're going to go over how to properly keep a patient modest. So putting their gowns on, believe it or not, can be a tricky thing. And then we usually put a second gown over a patient's back to help keep them covered since our gowns do open in the back. So we have our patient Liza here today that I'm going to demonstrate on. Hi Liza, how are you? I'm well, how are you? Good. I'm going to help you get your gown buttoned up here. Okay. So each gown has several buttons down each sleeve and the gown should be tied behind the patient. One big marker to look out for is the neckline on the patient. So we want to make sure that that's in the center and then we should be able to button up each of these. And it's really nice if the patient has lines to take a gown off, all we need to do is unbutton that and we can pull this right out from underneath and button it back up on top as needed. We're just gonna button part of this sleeve here. There also should be different size gowns depending on what hospital you're in. So obviously this is a standard patient gown. If you have a bariatric size patient, you should get them a bariatric size gown so it covers more of them. Okay, so next we're gonna help Liza up to the edge of the bed. And after, we'll, after we do that, we'll get make sure her backside is covered before we proceed any further. So I'm gonna use the bed to my advantage. These hospital beds, there's different models in each hospital, but they all should have some basic functions of up and down, raising the head up and down, etc. So if you look on the side panels here, we have some labels, bed up and down, head up and down, knees up and down, etc., that we can use to help make sure that our bodies are staying safe and we have good mechanics with transfers. So I am going to lower this bed closer to the ground for when we get up. And lower the knees down so she's not going over a hill. Then to lower the railing, there should be some sort of mechanism here to unlock the railing and slide it down. Some railings go sort of in a round motion to go down, some of them go straight down. So make sure to spend some time checking out the beds in whatever hospital setting you end up in. Okay, I am also going to sit Liza's head up a little bit here, just to make it easier for her to stand up, to sit up on the edge of the bed. Okay, Liza, I'm gonna have you start scooting your legs this way towards the edge of the bed. Excellent. I'm going to help you with your trunk a little bit and we're going to come up to sitting. Excellent. Can you keep scooting forward to get your feet down to the ground? Good. We want to make sure her feet are planted on the ground and we don't want to immediately walk away from our patient in case she doesn't have good trunk control. So I'm keeping a hand on her and getting a good feel for that. Okay. You okay sitting there for a moment? I'm feeling good. Okay. So next I'm going to show you how to prepare another gown to put over her back. There are two different ways that we like to do this. The first one is called making a cape. Both of them really make a cape, but again, our main landmark on these gowns is the neckline. So if you find the neckline, the rest of the buttons and sleeves are going to look like big floppy pieces. So our other landmark is going to be the tie on the neckline. That's what goes behind the back. So if we find the button that's closest to that tie and the button that's closest to the neckline, connect those two. Then do the same thing on the other side. So the button that's closest to the tie, the button that's closest to the neckline. Now we have more of a solid piece of fabric here with two ties on it, just like a cape. So we're gonna throw this over Liza's back and we can tie it in front, just like so. That'll help keep her covered. An alternative way to do this would be to come under the patient's arm. So using those same two snaps that we use, the one near the neckline and the one near the tie, we come under her arm Snap there, snap there, 
Now we don't even necessarily need to tie that. That is on her arms, and when she stands up, that'll stay and cover her back. Okay. Okay, so our next step is we're gonna get Liza the rest of the way prepared to get out of bed. Now that we've gotten her up and she's modest, we took her other gown off. So one thing not to forget is our hospital socks. We don't want patients up with just regular socks on or with bare feet. A lot of patients don't like these, but I tell them it's hospital policy. We don't want them to have a fall. That's a lot of paperwork for us. So I'm just gonna throw these socks right on. We can throw them over her regular socks. Perfect. These have some nice non-skid stuff on the bottom to help keep her from slipping on these slippery floors. Next, we're gonna throw a gate belt on. So I'm gonna grab my gate belt come around my patient. I'm going to come underneath your arms here, Liza. Pull this through. Get it pretty snug here. Back through and then we can just kind of tuck the tail in wherever we need. There are a couple considerations with this in the ICU. We need to be conscious of what lines the patient have has. So if she had chest tubes or a drive line for an LVAD, any sort of drain here in this area, we'd wanna be very conscious of where this is, not hitting those. Um, we can also move it up into more of the armpit area, especially on men, that works pretty well to get a good hold of them. Or to have it way down lower on their hips as long as you have it nice and tight so it's not riding up. Next, I'm just gonna show you how to switch the oxygen over. So Liza was on, let's say, it was on three liters per minute of oxygen on the wall. So if we look here, this is our oxygen flow meter. And there's just a dial here that dials up and down the oxygen. Remember the oxygen is a controlled drug, essentially. It has to be prescribed by a doctor. But we as therapists should have an order in our chart to titrate oxygen to keep levels above 90% usually. So we can titrate this. Often patients will need a little bit more oxygen when they're up and moving than they do when they're in bed. So that's something to keep in mind. So I'm going to take the oxygen off the wall and put it on our portable tank here so that we can go walking. So first things first, I wanna make sure the portable tank has enough oxygen in it. So there's a little gas meter here, empty to full. We wanna make sure that there's at least a thousand in there and then we're going to turn this on by flipping this dial so we're going to put that on three we can hear the air coming out so we know that it's on then we can grab this nasal cannula here right off the wall and put that end right there Liza, well, i'm going to have you remove your mask so that i can put this nasal cannula on you for a moment we have the prongs on this nasal cannula. We wanna make sure that they're facing up and out. That'll be more comfortable to go on the nose. So we're just gonna place this in her nostrils and around her ears. And then we can tighten this part here so that it stays on. In these COVID times, we can have a patient pla place their mask back on. I'll turn this off for you, Liza, so you don't have oxygen in your nose. We can have them put their mask back on over the oxygen once that is on. We do have a few other options for oxygen delivery. I'll show you just some of our common ones here. So this is just a simple mask. If the patient were on six or eight liters, this would be the appropriate mode of delivery for that. Just goes on and over the head. And if they're on more than 10 liters, we typically want a non-rebreather, partial non-rebreather this mask that has a bag. So it fills up a reservoir here of oxygen. Again, that just goes on over their face like that. They all have a very similar end to just go right on the IV pole or on the oxygen tank right there. Then lastly, to make this portable, the IV pole, if you had IV pumps on here, it needs power. So it's probably plugged into the wall this is something that's okay for us to unplug. We don't need to ask nursing about this. This is just general power. Everything on the IV pole should have battery backup on it. So 
depending on the configuration of your IV pole, you can kind of just loop this around, make sure those don't dangle. And now we're completely portable and ready to go. One other thing that you'll find in all your ICUs is your telemetry monitor. So different ICUs are gonna have different brands. We use the Philips monitors here. Up here, if they were actually connected to our patient, we'd have all of our EKG, our SpO2, our blood pressures, respiratory rate, depending on what lines they have, you might also have a CVP or a PAP, so measures of right heart function. Um, so important buttons on here, there should, on any monitor, be some sort of silence button. So if there's something alarming, as long as it's not something alarming that we need to alert nursing about. Sometimes if the patient's moving a lot, um, you might have a lot of noise on your EKG lines. It might be that we can just press silence to pause that alarm. Another good button that's usually on most um, monitors is the start stop button. That is to take a manual blood pressure. If they have a blood pressure cuff on and a cord connected for that, we can press start stop and that will run the cuff to get a pressure there. In order to go walking with a patient or leave the bedside, most hospital monitors have some sort of portable telemetry. So these may look different, connect differently at each hospital, but we can pull this whole thing off and we now have our EKG and our monitor all here. So before we go walking, we disconnect that from the wall. We can bring this over and we can set it right on our ID pole or we can hang it up up here if you're tall enough to see just somewhere where we can see it because in the ICU it's important to be able to have an eye on your patient's vitals while you're up and moving so now when we get up we have that with us on the IV pole at all times after our session we're going to make sure that this patient is settled back in bed I'm going to take her gate belt off so that's not comfortable like in bed we already took her second gown or her cape off so she's not laying on wrinkles. Pull that right through. So we're going to put the oxygen still on her. We're going to take the oxygen and put it back on the wall. This is a really important thing to not ever forget when you leave the room because if you leave it on the tank, well, the tank will eventually run out of oxygen and then your patient will probably start to desat. So we're going to take this back off, make sure that is off plug this back into the wall and turn it up to the appropriate three liters that she was on. And we'd have this on her, of course. Next, we wanna make sure that the IV pole is plugged back into the wall. That will too eventually run out of battery. Anything important in a hospital should be in red plugs. These are usually plugs that are hooked up to generators. So if the power goes out, these will kick back on. So anything important like medications, ventilators, dialysis machines should all be on there. I'm going to show quickly our patient Liza here doesn't need these but if your patient did have restraints on before we want to make sure to put these back on afterwards. So there's different kinds of restraints at each hospital. They typically have some sort of velcro, some sort of buckle fashion here and then depending on your facility Depending on the beds, we're going to have some sort of bar underneath here and you can see there's even a logo here that says this is where we put restraints. So we're going to loop that through and when you start at a hospital they'll teach you how to do a quick release knot. So now Liza can't move her arm very much to get out of bed or anything, but when we need to release it all we have to do is grab the tails and pull and now she's free. So that's a specific kind of knot that's used for restraints for patient safety. We'll take this back off here. Another thing we wanna do when a patient gets back in bed is put back on their SCDs, sequential compression devices. These help um, move the blood around in the lower legs, help prevent blood clots from forming when patients are flat in bed for long periods of time. So maybe you lift your leg up, Liza. And these just go on like so. They've got some Velcro straps. Again, you might find different brands, different colors of these at different hospitals. But they all function pretty similarly. 
go. So we'll just fasten those up. Then we've got our SCD machine right here that we can take the two ends of these and hook them up to our SCDs and turn this machine on. This will now intermittently inflate and deflate to help prevent blood from stagnating in the legs. Um, before we leave the room, we also want to make sure that the patient has their call light. Never ever leave this where it can't be reached by the patient. That puts them at risk of falls if they need something and they don't know how to call for help. They're more likely to try to climb out of bed. So we want this nice and close to the patient where they can reach it. We want to make sure that they understand how to use it. So especially patients with some delirium or cognitive deficits, we want to make sure we review with them that this big red button is how you call for the nurse. Most call lights will also work the lights, the TV, other things like that. Then we want to make sure our patient's comfortable. We ask them if they want a blanket, maybe get some more pillows. Tuck them in nice and tidy. Okay, Liza, is there anything else you need right now? Are you comfortable? Yep, I'm good to go. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna enter an ICU room now. A couple things to point out outside the room. There should be gloves to don before you don gloves. You always wanna use some hand sanitizer or wash your hands in a nearby sink, make sure your hands are clean. So we're gonna come into the room here. I'll just point out a few things that we'll notice. We've got a chair set up here for the patient. Here's their IV pole with their pumps. They are not currently on. This patient is not on any drips at the moment. Again, we've got our oxygen flow meter. There may or may not be a humidifier associated with that flow meter. That's just to provide some humidity so the air doesn't dry their nose out so much. Patient should have a tray table with their various things on it, including their incentive spirometer, which we wanna teach them how to use, help prevent atelectasis and pneumonia. We've got other patient belongings, usually lots of stacks of pillows, Sharps container, more gloves within the room always in case you need them without leaving the room. A computer that you can check your chart if you need anything. We've got our telemetry monitor here. You can see that his is hooked up. So we're looking at our EKG, our SpO2, respiratory rate, and he's got a blood pressure cuff on. A couple other things to know. We usually have a tank of oxygen in the room and an Ambu bag and some airways just in case of an emergency. Those are always stocked in every ICU room. Other things stocked may be on shelves or in drawers. We've got things in drawers like alcohol pads, flushes that the nurses use to flush medications, cleaning wipes if needed, any other patient supplies, including bandages, etc. We do have a sink. Usually there is a patient closet of some sort with belongings in it. Sink and toilet. Oftentimes in an ICU, the toilet is in the middle of the room instead of having a closed bathroom, which is unfortunate. But we do want to keep an eye on patients while they're up. So overall, as we come into the room, we can just scan and see what we need. We realize we have the chair set up already. I spot some socks over here. We've got plenty of pillows. We know we've got a full oxygen tank over there. Anything we might need to get this patient up and moving.